Hi, I'm Dan Reznicek from Pacific Northwest Urology Specialists, and today we're going to be discussing prostate cancer risk stratification. In a recent video, I went over the basics of prostate cancer, how it's diagnosed, what is staging, what grading means. In this video, we're going to combine those and we're going to talk about risk stratification for prostate cancer. The risk of localized prostate cancer can vary tremendously overall. There are some very slow growing cancers that are unlikely to cause a problem for more than 10 years. And there are some highly aggressive prostate cancers that can spread and cause symptoms within months to years. So our treatments and recommendations for prostate cancer should be individualized to the patient based on the aggressiveness of the cancer that we're dealing with and a patient's overall life expectancy. This video is gonna go over what factors we know of that determines prostate cancer aggressiveness. This topic can be confusing if you are just learning about prostate cancer for the first time. Hopefully you have a good urologist or oncologist to explain risk stratification to you and give you your overall risk group. However, if you're just trying to learn on your own or want more information about how we determine risk, this video is for you. There are a lot of tools that look at aggressiveness of prostate cancer and can predict outcomes. Many studies have looked into this. Certain risk factors have increased outcomes, or sorry, certain risk factors have increased negative outcomes. These negative outcomes that we talk about are measured in terms of cancer recurrence or metastasis at a later date, or even death. For example, different grades have very different risks of cancer recurrence. Here's an article from Dr. Epstein from the Journal of Pathology and Lab Laboratory Medicine. This compared the risks of cancer recurrence for patients who underwent a prostatectomy from five institutions for a total of over 20,000 men. In the study, men with high-grade prostate cancer had a very high risk of recurrence over time. While as you can see, low-grade prostate cancer had less than a 10% of recurrence at 10 years. So the risk changes dramatically based on the grade of the prostate cancer. Most cancer guidelines that give patients and doctors recommendations like the National Comprehensive Cancer Network break down treatment guidelines based on specific risk groups where they classify men into a category of risk based on a variety of factors. We're gonna go over the NCCN guidelines is they're the ones that are used most by urologists and oncologists together. And we're gonna determine how you can find what risk group you are in. If you already know, you can skip ahead to one of our other videos on prostate cancer. And in the future, I'm gonna place videos um, based on treatments for prostate cancer. So when we talk about guidelines, it's important to know what year we're talking about because prostate cancer treatment changes tremendously by years. The most recent guideline is the 2025 National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So how do we determine risk for prostate cancer? We're gonna to need to know a few different factors. First, the digital rectal exam that the physician did on your first evaluation is a part of the staging. Next, we need to look at the PSA score. And then finally, the biopsy results to determine the grade of cancer. For some men with prostate cancer, additional staging with imaging is warranted. For other men, imaging is not currently required, but for more aggressive prostate cancers, it's recommended to tell if the prostate cancer has spread. As we talk about these various risk groups and stratifications and variables, it's important to note when calculating risk for most of these variables, and when we talk about low, medium, or high risk, we typically go off of the highest factor available. So if we're looking at three different items, such as the stage, the grade, and the PSA, if any individual one of these items is a higher risk group, that item trumps the other items we're talking about. Most of the time, this is not a complex cal cal calculation, adding up various factors, but unfortunately, for some subtle variations, it is a bit more complicated. But overall, if you can remember that one item that's high risk will trump the other risks, that will generally um, be
be a good rule as we go forward. When looking at NCCN risk classification, they break it down into three overarching categories based on the stage of the cancer or how far it is spread. Those three categories include localized prostate cancer, regional risk prostate cancer, and metastatic prostate cancer. Clinically localized prostate cancer means cancer that is only seen within the prostate itself. To have this risk group, you can have no lymph node involvement or metastatic disease. Most of the rest of this video is going to be going over the subgroups within clinically localized prostate cancer. The reason for this is that the NCCN has broken down clinically localized prostate cancer into five different risk groups and two subgroups, and we're going to go over those in depth because the treatments vary based on what, which risk group you're in. They range from very low risk prostate cancer to very high risk. The group after clinically localized prostate cancer is called the regional risk group of prostate cancer. Regional risk group prostate cancer means that you have cancer within the prostate as well as lymph node involvement. It can be any variation of the localized prostate cancer, but once any evidence shows that it's in the lymph nodes, it's automatically um, trumped in its regional risk group prostate cancer. The last overall large risk group is metastatic prostate cancer. So metastatic prostate cancer means that you have some prostate cancer outside of the prostate and outside of the main lymph nodes. If there's any cancer beyond those main lymph nodes at all, you fall into metastatic prostate cancer. So no matter what the factors were for the local prostate, the lymph nodes, any metastatic disease is automatically metastatic prostate cancer. The treatments for metastatic prostate cancer are generally systemic therapies or medications that treat the whole body. I'll have an upcoming video on metastatic prostate cancer in the future, but this is a large topic. This type of cancer is generally not curable, but is highly treatable. In the last few years, there have been many exciting developments in the treatment of metastatic prostate cancer. So regional risk group and metastatic prostate cancer are fairly straightforward. Lymph node involvement or metastatic disease automatically puts you in those categories. But as we look at clinically localized prostate cancer, it's a bit more complex. For clinically localized prostate cancer, generally there are rules about how a cancer is classified. In general, to be the lowest risk, you have to have the lowest PSA, the lowest grade score, and the lowest stage. If any single factor is a higher risk, generally that moves you up to a higher risk group. But this is not always the case. As you can see, there are five overall risk groups. Intermediate risk prostate cancer is further divided into a breakdown of two subgroups. So let's start by looking at low and very low risk prostate cancer. These risk groups are very similar. There have been some discussion about, about combining both of these groups as their management is very similar, but for now they are different, so we'll talk about them. To be in the lowest group of prostate cancer risk, known as very low, a patient cannot have palpable prostate nodule, so they must be diagnosed with a PSA alone or an incidental finding, clinical stage T1C. They have to have the lowest prostate cancer grade group. In the new grading system, this would be grade group one prostate cancer. In the old system, it would be Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6. In addition to this, they also have to have a PSA that's less than 10 and a PSA density of less than 0.15 nanograms per milliliter per gram. This means that you have to know both the PSA and the size of the prostate based on either an ultrasound used during the biopsy or an MRI finding. You take someone's overall PSA and you divide it by the prostate size. This is done because benign prostate tissue makes some PSA in addition to prostate cancer. If someone's PSA density is low, that suggests that much of the PSA in that lab test checked from your blood 
is coming from benign tissue rather than prostate cancer. This PSA density concept is only used in very low risk prostate cancer. I find this fairly confusing for patients and not particularly helpful and hopeful, hopefully going forward, it's removed from the guidelines. But back to very low risk prostate cancer, there's another factor that needs to be present. The number of cores positive needs to be less than three. They don't specify how many cores are taken, but the standard is usually 12. And less than 50% of all the cores, or sorry, less than 50% of an individual core should be positive. So to be in the very low risk prostate cancer group, you have to have a tiny of, amount of cancer present, one or two cores, there can't be a palpable nodule, your PSA has to be less than 10, and the cancer has to be the lowest grade group, Gleason grade uh, group one, or the old system, grade, uh, Gleason three plus three equals six. Like I said, this is fairly confusing. However, the one interesting thing about very low risk prostate cancer is that when you look at the treatment options as recommended by the NCCN, they do not recommend treatment. The only recommendations are active surveillance, which means closely monitoring your prostate cancer, and observation, which in terms of prostate cancer means not really following the cancer, but treating it if the cancer starts to cause symptoms for the patient. For very low risk prostate cancer patients who have 10 years of more life expectancy, the recommendation is active surveillance. For those with less than 10 years of life expectancy, the recommendation is observation. To be in the low risk prostate cancer group, you just have to have a PSA of less than 10, Gleason grade group one, or the old system three plus three equals six. You can't have a grade group higher than one, and you can't have a PSA higher than 10. Otherwise, to be in low risk prostate cancer, you also have to have either the stage T1C, which means you found it by a PSA alone, or a small nodule when you palpate the prostate cancer, less than one half of one side of the prostate. But for most people, if you just remember, low risk prostate cancer is the lowest grade um, and a PSA less than 10, that covers most patients. For the next risk category, which is intermediate risk prostate cancer, the NCCN has broken it down into two subgroups, favorable and unfavorable intermediate risk. Men in this category must have a clinical stage of less than clinical T3 or outside the prostate into the seminal vesicles, a PSA less than 20, and a Gleason group of three or less. This group can be somewhat confusing. So first let's look at favorable intermediate risk disease. To be in favorable intermediate risk group, you basically have to other, have otherwise low risk prostate cancer, but one factor that's considered intermediate risk disease. The exception of this is you cannot have Gleason grade three prostate cancer or four plus three equals seven as that grade is automatically considered unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. Are you confused yet? <laughs> Okay, let's look at a few examples. First, if you have otherwise low risk prostate cancer, grade group one disease, non-palpable nodule, but a PSA of 10 to 20, you have favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. Likewise, if you have a PSA of less than 10, a non-palpable cancer, less than 50% of the cores are positive, and you have grade group two disease, you also have favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. However, if you have two or more of these intermediate risk factors, you automatically become unfavorable intermediate risk disease. For example, Gleason grade two prostate cancer and a PSA greater than 10, that's two risk factors, that grade group two disease and a PSA between 10 and 20. Like I said before, grade group three prostate cancer is automatically unfavorable intermediate risk disease. So why do we go into all these confusing differences between favorable and unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer? Although this is confusing, there is a big difference in terms of treatment recommendations between favorable and unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. 
for favorable intermediate risk, the NCCN lists three different options for localized prostate cancer with equal weight for men over 10 years of life expectancy. That means they can recommend active surveillance, surgery, or radiation to patients, depending on your discussion with your urologist. If we look at unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, for men with over 10 years of life expectancy, there is no longer any recommendation for active surveillance. So once we cross the threshold from favorable to unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, automatically it's recommended that we look at treatment for men with more than 10 years of life expectancy. Additionally, for men with unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer or higher, we start to see additional staging recommendations. So for these patients, staging at this point should include soft tissue imaging and should consider bone imaging. All right, let's move into the next risk group, which is high risk prostate cancer, high risk clinically localized prostate cancer. So for high risk prostate cancer, if you have otherwise low risk disease or intermediate risk disease, but a single factor is high risk, you automatically have high risk prostate cancer. So what factors make someone high risk? This includes a PSA greater than 20, a clinical stage T3 or higher, or Gleason grade groups four or five prostate cancer. In the old system, this would be four plus four equals eight, five plus four equals nine, four plus five equals nine. There is an additional NCCN group called high, very high risk disease. There's not a huge difference between high risk and very high risk, but there just needs to be two factors of high risk disease or a single PSA greater than 40. But as we see, the treatment recommendations are fairly similar. So for high risk disease, what are those treatment recommendations? If we look at the algorithm, the treatment recommendations are actually very similar to unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, with the exception that treatment is recommended for men with more than five years of life expectancy. However, if men have less than five years of life expectancy, if the patient's symptomatic with either urinary obstruction, pain, ureteral obstruction, the recommendation is still to treat the prostate cancer. The reason for this is that even men with less than five years of life expectancy, highly aggressive prostate cancer that's causing symptoms tends to progress quickly and can become more symptomatic or painful. While we're talking about treatment recommendations, let's look at the regional risk group of prostate cancer. So again, regional risk group is any local stage or grade, but lymph node disease is present on staging. Recommendations for these individuals changes slightly. The preferred treatment is radiation plus androgen deprivation therapy. Several studies showed that a prostatectomy is not helpful if there's a high volume of node disease. However, if there's a patient with an isolated lymph node or for younger men, surgery may be a good option. For these men, surgery is not likely curative, but is likely going to be part of a multimodal approach to treating the prostate cancer. As stated before, for high risk, sorry, as stated before, for metastatic prostate cancer, the treatments are going to be systemic therapies. All right, so I've just covered risk stratifications for prostate cancer. It's a fairly confusing topic. Typically, this is gonna be covered by your urologist. If you have any questions, I would recommend looking at the NCCN guidelines or National Comprehensive Cancer Network, as they've got great resources to put you in a correct risk group. The risk grouping is essential. It helps us determine which patients need which treatments. I hope you liked our video for us today. If you have any questions, again, nccn.org. Thank you.